Chair, you are live. All right, thank you, Haley and city staff. Welcome everybody to our June meeting of the Urban Forestry Commission. Glad you could all make it. Thank you for joining us. All right, so we'll start off with uh, introductions. So my name's Amy Smith. I'm the chair of the Urban Forestry Commission. And I'll go ahead and call on people just to make it easier so you can unmute and introduce yourself. So Patrick. Patrick Gilbert, vice chair of the Urban Forestry Commission. Thanks, Ed. Ed, you're muted. <laughs> you're right, I am muted. Um, can you all read lips? <laughs> <laughs> Ed Macy, Urban Forestry Commission and Chair of the Tree Protection Task Force. Thanks. Sharon? Uh, Sharon Summerall, Urban Forestry Commission and TRC representative. Thanks. Steve? Uh, Stephen Hendricks, uh, past chair of the Urban Forestry Commission. All right. Uh, Kim, thanks for coming in. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Kim Roney. I serve on the Asheville City Council and I'm grateful to spend this time with you today. All right, thank you. All right, so we have some city staff here today. So Haley. Hi, my name is Haley Mahoney. I'm a planning technician with Development Services and I help assist with the Urban Forestry Commission. All right, Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Watford. I'm the site engineering coordinator with Development Services and Urban, uh, Urban Forestry Commission staff liaison. Thanks. Um, all right, I'll just go around. How about um, Mark? Hello, Mark Foster, City Arborist, Asheville Public Works Department. All right, Ben? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Woody. I'm the Director of Development Services. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ricky, you're here. Yeah, I'm here. Ricky Hurley with the zoning uh, plan review section. All right, um, Jennifer, are you here? Yep, I'm here. I'm Jennifer Blevins, urban planner with the development services department. All right, and Mike? Yep, Mike are Wheeler, uh, urban planner with the development services department. Thank you. Did I get all the city staff? There's a couple names I don't recognize. Oh, Monty, please. Yeah, I'm Monty Clampett. I'm the Site Inspection and Zoning Enforcement Coordinator for City of Nashville. Thank you. All right, and I think, is there any other city staff? Go ahead and jump on if I missed you. Is that everybody? Oh, Valerie, go ahead. Hey, I'm Valerie Wellborn. Um, sorry, it's dark behind me. I didn't turn on my lights for this. Um, I am with the Stormwater Capital Projects Program in Public Works. Awesome, thank you. All right. And so I believe then we also have uh, folks from some of our alternative compliance projects. So if you guys just want to go around and introduce yourself if I haven't called on you, go ahead and unmute. Eric Davis, Serpa 678 Landscape Architect, uh, working with Dorothea and Clark Nexon on the Southside Rec Center project. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Now jump in right afterwards, uh, Dorothea Schultz, that's me. I'm the project architect for the Dr. Wesley Grant Center expansion. Um, and maybe I give it over to Dustin, who is with the city. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dustin Clemens. I'm a program manager with the city's capital projects department. I'm here also for the 285 Livingston Street alternative compliance request. All right, and I see Devin. Yes, Devin Staley with uh, Civil Engineer with Blue Ridge Engineering here for the request at uh, 100 Airport Road, the Valvoline uh, Quick Loop Project. Great, thank you. And anyone on the phone that uh, we don't have a name attached to, go ahead and introduce yourself. Is that it? All right. Well, Don just jumped in. Don, we were just doing introductions. If you want to take a minute and introduce yourself. Hi, sorry, I'm late. Um, I'm Don Chavez. I'm the Ash uh, director of Asheville Greenworks and a member of the Urban Forestry Commission. All right, thank you. If I miss anyone, Susan. oh, go ahead. Thank I'm you. Susan. Yes, I'm Susan Michael, uh, the board 
of Hawk Creek Community Association, and I'm here to to have a public comment. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for being here today. We will uh, go ahead and call the meeting to order and start with an approval of the minutes from May. Did everyone have a chance to see the packet? All right. I just need a motion and a second. So move. Second. Thank you. We'll have to do a roll call vote, starting with Patrick. Aye. Ed. Aye. Sharon. Aye. Steve. Aye. Dawn. Aye. And I vote aye. I do want to note real quick, sorry to go back, but we will note that Cecil Bothwell, Perrin DeYoung, and Roy Smith are absent from today's meeting. All right, so moving right along to alternative compliance. Um, I know there's a packet from the city and we'll start with 110 Airport Road. So when that gets pulled up on the screen and city staff can go ahead and begin when that's ready. And while we're waiting for that to come on the screen, um, this is Jennifer Blevins again. This is a project, it's uh, at a new address assigned 110 Airport Road. This is directly in front of Carolina Furniture Concept. And um, it's, a, it's a relatively basic request. Um, we've reviewed the level one site plan for, uh, we're, we're looking at three different developments uh, on out parcels in front of the current Carolina Furniture Concept. And um, this particular project is actually uh, complying with all of the landscaping requirements, except they have the one issue. They're street trees, which are required to be along the Walmart access drive. That is providing the required frontage for their parcel. Um, they have some existing uh, water line and storm pipe easements in that location right along that access drive. So they are not able to place their three required street trees within the um, 20 feet of the street is the maximum um, per the UDO. And their trees are going to be approximately 40 feet from the street. Um, otherwise, their project meets all of the standards, both in Article 11 and in our Tree Canopy Preservation Ordinance, Article 19. So that is their request to you today. Uh, we've evaluated the proposal and agree that this is a good solution, recommend approval. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Jennifer. And I believe we have a representative from the project as well, if there are any questions. Yes, Devin Staley is here and has drawn this, this uh, landscape plan and the site plan for the project. Um, so if you have any questions for him, I'm sure he'd be happy to entertain those. All right, are there any questions about this project? No, pretty straightforward one. If we're ready, we can move on to a vote. Uh, well, let me make sure there's nobody on for public comment. Oh, thank you, sure. Do we have any public comment for 110 Airport Road? <coughs> Doesn't sound like it, okay. Oh, Haley, we lost your audio, there you go. Haley lost your audio. Uh, there is a public comment on the line. I have unmuted them. Public commentary you might have to press star three. Public commentary you might have. Ah. Uh. Public caller, if you press star three Public to unmute. Caller, if you press star three to unmute. 
Okay, I'm just going to assume they don't have comments on this particular item. We'll try to hit them on the next item. All right. Okay. Uh, if there is nothing else, we can go ahead and if there's a motion. I move that we uh, approve this request. A second. Second. Thank you. All right. Roll call vote. So, Patrick? Aye. Ed? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Dawn? Aye. And I vote aye. So that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Devin and any others for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Um, so moving along to 285 Livingston Street, looks like Mike will walk us through this um, application. Mike, did you have anything for the Grant Center project or was someone else going to speak first? Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, okay. my, my name is Mike Wheeler with the Development Services Department. The next project that you're looking at is the Dr. Wesley Grant Senior Center. Uh, it's located at 285 Livingston Street. It's currently zoned RAD OSP, and it's about a 9.37 acre tract. Um, the property does have some existing uh, recreational center facilities. Uh, they're proposing to actually add both indoor and outdoor recreational areas to the existing uh, development. Um, the building itself is going to be about 13,116 square feet. And there's also some other outdoor recreational areas being uh, submitted for basketball courts, swimming pools, and et cetera. Uh, based on the scope of the project, the code is, requires the site to be brought into full compliance with the uh, requirements for landscaping. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the, the property has two street frontages, one off of uh, Livingston and one off of Depot Street. And <clears throat> the code says when you have uh, more than one street frontage, if you're adjacent to residential, which this particular project is on the west side uh, along Depot Street, uh, it's on RMA, then you're required to actually provide a buffer yard along that street frontage instead of the typically required street trees. The code does allow you to do only street trees, but it's only if, if you have a pedestrian oriented design development. And this particular development um, currently is not pedestrian-oriented design. And based on the proposal, I don't see any way that they could make this a pedestrian-oriented design just based on the existing uh, location of the buildings and parking. However, um, it is a rec center. Uh, there are sidewalks and on-street parking along both street frontages. And so it's definitely going to be pedestrian used, it's just not a pedestrian oriented design. So the code, the strict letter of the code requires they provide that type A buffer on Depot Street. Um, and that's a 20 foot wide buffer planted with the various evergreen trees, large deciduous trees, small deciduous tree, trees, shrubs uh, of um, various sizes and shapes. And they have about 570 feet of frontage along Depot Street that would require that buffer yard. So what they're proposing to do is to leave, there are some existing trees along uh, Depot Street um, that would serve as street trees. Uh, they're also proposing to supplement some areas along Depot Street where there are some gaps between the trees with some existing, with some new vegetation but basically, they don't want to just, you know, disturb those particular trees and replant or plant a buffer yard that would probably impact those trees as well. They they basically want to take the material that the buffer was required to have there and distribute it throughout the site. If you'll notice on your screen, there's a site plan and all the variations of green symbols that you see 
or areas of the site where they would distribute the required landscaping that was for that buffer yard. So if you um, take a look at that, they're going to pretty much well spread that throughout the site. We have reviewed the site for level one uh, compliance and they are meeting all other applicable requirements of the code, except for this particular request. So um, that's about all I have on the issue and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Mike. And we do have representatives from the project if there are any questions for them. So any questions? Oh, some hands are up. All right, Sharon. Um, I've neglected to notice, Mike, if there was tree protection uh, fencing on the existing trees that are going to be saved. I forgot to look. Um, good question. Working from home is difficult sometimes, so yeah. bear with me. <laughs> well, if not, if you could just add them so that uh, with all the construction that's going to go on around there, um, they're going to need some protection. If I may jump sure. in, this is uh, Dorothea Schultz from Clark Nixon uh, and Eric Davis could also back me up. I believe that we have specified a tree protection zone around existing trees to purpose purposefully protect them. And we do have uh, tree protection as part of this project. Yes, uh, that is correct. Uh, I'm sorry, when you say zone, does that mean fencing as required to the UDO? Yes, we show tree protection fencing on our on our documents. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, Absolutely. I forgot to look. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Patrick, go ahead. Yeah, when you have um, existing expansion development on a site that has um, already has a uh, development like this, does, is it subject to the tree canopy preservation ordinance seven nineteen one? This expansion would yes would require that. So that's a yes. It would comply have to comply with seven nineteen one, correct? Yes. Thank you. Let, let, let me just verify that. Uh, I can't remember exactly when this project got submitted, just to make sure. But it's been a minute since I've looked at this project. If you'll bear with me here. All right. While Mike's looking that up, Ed, did you still have another question? You're on mute still. One button. I apologize. Um, no, both the questions I had were already asked. Thank you. All right. Um, any other questions, Patrick? Did you have a new question? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was okay. trying to turn off my hand. <laughs> all right. And I can't see all the little squares. So if anyone else has a question that I can't see a hand raise, go ahead and jump on. <clears throat> All right. Patrick, you put your hand up again. <laughs> Just want to make sure there's not any other questions. Okay. Um, so any other discussion or questions for the applicants on this project? All right. Any public comment on this project? Let's see. Caller? If you have public comment for this one, please press star three. If there's no public comment, then we will move move on to vote. Okay. All right. Well, then, if, oh, go ahead. If I, could, if I could go ahead and answer that question. Yes, yes. tree canopy is required and is uh, has been satisfied with our review of the project. Okay. Oh. Wait, we might have had somebody pop up. Go ahead. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Call you should. Hi. Um, this is John Harper. Hello. I have a question. Uh, this is Steve. Yeah, Steve, hold on just a sec. Caller, did you have something? Oh, I think she made it on. Hold on a second. Okay. Caller, go ahead. Yes, uh, this is Shivanda Harper calling from the uh, Asheville Housing Authority. 
And I do have a question. Um, the trees that are along uh, depots, which would be on the west side of the street, so closer to the apartments there, um, are, are those trees included in this tree canopy or part of this uh, tree planting that's, um, that's happening? And, and, and these trees sit like on the road? Yeah, those trees along Depot Street that are on uh, the uh, this project's property along their boundary uh, will be preserved. They will actually be adding a few other trees in that particular line of street trees, and then they'll also be adding okay. other shrubs to the to the project. But I think for the caller's question, okay. the trees on the other side of the street, on the side with the apartments, are not part of this project. That's separate. That's correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay. If there's no okay. public comment, um, and, and then uh, Steve Stephen Hendricks, I believe, had a question or a comment. Right. Um, yeah, this sounds like a, a little comment first. It sounds like a reasonable way to handle this situation um, with some of these counting as street trees and so forth, and some additional trees being added to the site. Uh, my question is more general. Uh, when when we have a, a situation where the tree preservation ordinance comes up, um, should we document the calculations? In other words, um, as a tracker in the future, um, we, you know, we'll have in the future a lot of projects that will, you know, where it will apply. And some will come before us and some won't. Um, should we request that those calculations be tracked somehow? Um, yeah, Steve, we already have requested that okay. and it is happening. We're actually going to talk about that in um, okay. the later part okay. of the meeting. Because, yes, right. that is a. I've forgotten if we had specifically yeah. asked that question. That so, is a perfect question. And yeah, we'll dig into the okay. uh, right. details on that. Of, you know, it doesn't, we won't see those calculations, but it would be nice to have them documented as we go along. We yeah. Won't, but we could see them if we requested it for like a very large project. We want to see those probably. Right. So we're going to talk about the details of what data is and will be tracked. So yeah, okay. we'll add that in for later. But thank you. All right. A couple other hands went up. Were there questions still out there? No, you're good. Okay. If there is no other discussion or questions, if there is a motion. I, I move that we approve the request. And I just want to say that I appreciate the effort to save the existing trees and still meet the buffer requirements by dispersing the trees throughout the rest of the property. It's sort of doing more than is really required. And, and um, I, I appreciate that extra effort. It reflects the spirit of the no net loss canopy um, approach that we're trying to accomplish. So thank you very much. Yeah. And and I second that all the way around. Very good. So we have a motion to approve. So we will vote. Patrick? Aye. Ed? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Dawn? Aye. And I vote aye. So the motion passes. Thank you very much. And I just want to add that I do agree with what Ed said that the solution here seems to benefit everybody and maintain um, a healthy, uh, mature tree canopy. So we appreciate that. And we'll be um, keeping our eyes out for your tree protection fencing <laughs> when construction starts. So thank you very much for that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So we'll move on to our last alternative compliance, 301 Merriman. And it looks like yes, Mike. Uh Yep, Mike Wheeler again with the Development Services Department. This next request is for 301 Merriman Avenue. Uh, the property is currently zoned Community Business One. Uh, the site is fairly small. It's uh, 0.25 acres and has uh, an existing commercial building uh, that's located closer to Merriman Avenue. And then behind it is a two-story structure that has some residential uh, uses occurring in it. And the um, applicants proposing an adaptive reuse of the 
existing building uh, up front, the commercial portion, which has been vacant for, I believe, some time now. And they're proposing to uh, renovate that building and, and put an office use in there. They're also proposing to renovate the uh, residential building behind this building and uh, have two residential units um, once the renovations occur in that particular building. Based on the nature of the request, the code does require the site to be brought into full compliance with all the landscaping requirements. Uh, and in this particular uh, application, they do have they do abut some residential to the east and a portion of the north of their property that requires them to provide a type A buffer yard. Uh, if we could pull up the existing site plan, um, there is. Um, an existing building located at the back corner of the property that abuts the residential uses, which precludes their ability to put the buffer yard there. Um, and so what they're proposing to do is to install, to reduce the buffer width from 20 feet to 10 feet uh, in a couple of areas. And if we could look at the landscape plan. So the highlighted areas is where they're proposing to put some buffer plant material out in addition to a six foot high fence. These areas highlighted in yellow would be 10 feet wide uh, and planted with trees and shrubs um, to satisfy that buffer yard requirement. To the west is about 64 feet of frontage and to the north about 38 feet of frontage that would require the buffer yard. And there are some details for the fence. It'll be a solid fence with the finish side facing the neighboring property, which is typical requirements of our code. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Thank you, Mike. And the applicant, Jerry Snow, is also here if we have any questions. Any questions? <laughs> I do have a <clears throat> one comment. Sure. Um, I believe I sent some uh, current photos to Haley. I wonder if those are available. I wonder if Mike has those to show. Hey, Nancy, if you scroll down about, I think, two slides, three slides, we should get to his photos. Aha. Uh -huh. right there Good. and the slide after that one. Yeah, so our owner wanted me to ask the neighbor has just recently built a fence here we're still required to build uh, a fence parallel with that one well uh, the code would require you to provide the top a buffer yard jerry regardless of what the neighboring property has in terms of, um, you know, existing conditions. Mm -hmm. you, you've proposed an alternative that uses a privacy fence, um, but that could be something, you know, you could propose a different alternative and not use the fence and use vegetation. That was basically the alternative that you guys came up with. And so that's what we're presenting today. Does that make sense? Um, so we were proposing vegetation and a fence. He was, uh, our owner was asking. So the question is, if there's a fence there correct. now, since the application came through, it wouldn't necessarily make sense to add another fence. There is a fence there. It's just a slight change in the site conditions. And that fence is on the neighbor's property. I don't think for our purposes that changes this discussion. That'd be something you could work out with the city because what we're evaluating is if the fence plus available plantings would be sufficient to meet our goals for the mm -hmm. vegetation requirements. So I think that fence existing there can be considered part of the plan if everybody agrees it seems to make sense. So Sharon, you have a question? Um, yeah, the code states this has to be an opaque fence in order to meet the uh, reduction in the type of buffer by 50%. And 
And that is not an opaque fence. Not that I'm in disagreement with it, but it's not an opaque fence. No, the new piece of fence is the only piece they're talking about. They'll build more fence. Do you see what we're talking about? Just that I piece see there. That. I see yeah. that. I no, see they're not that. counting the four foot. The chain link. link. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We're just talking about, I believe that section looks like the brand new fence that the neighbor put in. So yeah. Thanks. Got it. All right. Any other discussion? Um, concerns or questions for this project it does seem like there are site conditions that do inhibit planting um mike is there the rest of the frontage like on the front side will meet all the requirements is that correct it will and this project is one project that will not trigger tree canopy protection so because it doesn't leave any of the thresholds but yes the site does meet all the other applicable landscaping requirements except for this buffer yard area. Okay. All right, any public comment on 301 Merriman? No other callers? I don't have any callers waiting. In the okay, chat. thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? If we're just gonna go on, we can take a motion. So move. Move, what do you move to approve or deny? Uh, or move recommend? To approve. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. <clears throat> we can go ahead and vote. So, Patrick? Aye. Ed? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Stephen? Aye. Dawn? Aye. And I vote aye. So, that's it. The motion passed. Right. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, so that wraps up alternative compliance. Next on the agenda is public comment, uh, general public comment, and I believe we had someone on the line. Is that person still here? Yes, I would like to make a comment. This is okay. This Go is ahead, Michael. introduce yourself. Yeah. yeah um, Um, my name is Susan Michael, and I live at 327 Old Haw Creek in Haw Creek, and I serve on the board of the Haw Creek Community Association. And I've long been a supporter of protecting trees and preserving our urban forest canopy. <clears throat> um, the reason I wanted to speak with you is uh, the property adjacent to ours is um, one point one and a third acre, less than 20 acres, but it, it's up for sale. And the real estate agent is encouraging the owner to sell to someone who would buy the property and subdivide it <clears throat> into two or three uh, building lots, or at least two. Um, and there are many large mature trees on the property. Some are look like they're 100, 150 years old that not only contribute to the city's urban tree canopy, but also contributes to the beauty of the neighborhood. And I understand that the city's new tree canopy preservation ordinance would not apply to this property once it's purchased and subdivided because it's less than two acres. Uh, and the ordinance, ordinance already exempts one and two dw dwelling units on a lot from its provisions. My concern is that if the property owners with lots between one and two acres in Hawk Creek or elsewhere in Asheville start selling their properties to investors and developers for subdividing into building lots. This exemption in the tree canopy preservation ordinance will have the unintended consequence of leaving more of our tree canopy unprotected. So I'm urging the Urban Forestry Commission to look into this potential loophole in the tree canopy ordinance, if possible, work with the city on figuring out the amount of tree canopy loss from construction due to exemption and make adjustments to the ordinance. <clears throat> the clock is kind of running out on Asheville's efforts to stem the loss of our urban tree canopy and I, we can't let time slip away. And so it's a big concern. Um, I think uh, there might be pictures of this, um, the trees that I'm talking about. Does Is that available to, to look at? I sent some to Patrick, I don't know if 
Awesome. They're in the packet. I don't know if we'll be able to put them on the screen, but they were in our agenda and documents for today. Okay. We are at three minutes. Okay. Sorry, the time is up. Thank but you. thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, I don't know, can I respond? <laughs> and I, I'm sure others might. Um, we do share, obviously, the concern of loss of mature trees on all property within the city. Unfortunately, much of the work we do as um, the city and the Urban Forestry Commission is limited, especially when it comes to private property. And so that's a huge limitation for us. Um, but Ed, did you have a comment? Yeah, I'm not sure if um, the Canopy Protection Amendment does apply to subdivisions. I'm not sure why there was an arbitrary, um, seems like a seemingly arbitrary decision as to the size of the piece of land that's excluded or not, except that I know that the city is, is focused on increasing density. Um, but I, uh, I can't speak for Chris Collins, but I do know that he's keeping uh, a bug list of uh, issues related to the new amendment uh, so that towards the end of the year we can revisit all of these issues that are arising and, and maybe make some decisions in, in the form of tweaks to the amendment. So if, if there's some some way we can get this issue added to Chris Collins' bug list, I think um, we can do what the caller was asking and that's to evaluate you know this current situation. I don't yeah, know that if, makes a lot of sense. If Ben, you're on the phone and you can relay this information to Chris or somebody can, um, Nancy, maybe. I can do that. Um, and some of this has to do with exempt flats versus non-exempt flats. So Correct. I can get that information. But if there are more than four parcels created out of this in a subdivision, it will trigger protection potential right yeah. yeah patrick go ahead yeah so um i did pose this question to chris collins and he referred to um a state exemption on um uh properties of two acres or less um and that's why uh, a property such as the one that susan michael described would be uh, exempt from the tree canopy preservation ordinance. The existing exemption um, was for the building of a single family dwelling unit, or uh, I guess a duplex, one or two um, dwelling unit construction. Um, developers buying uh, properties of less than two acres two acres or less and then subdividing them into building lots um again as susan uh stated in her comments that adds to the number of um uh, the amount of construction that is not protected by the tree canopy preservation ordinance so it's not clear whether the city considered that um, when it drew up its exemption to the tree canopy preservation ordinance. But it is something that I think the Urban Forestry Commission needs to pay attention to working alongside with DSD to make sure that, again, this isn't uh, some unintended consequence of the existing exemption and the preservation ordinance. All right, thank you, Patrick. Um, so I do agree. I think that the takeaway here is to add to the list of things that we're gonna keep an eye on um, with data, obviously, and look at these exemptions and possible issues, possible loopholes, as the caller called it, um, places where we might be able to improve the ordinance. All right, any other comment there? And yeah, we need to understand, um, I'd, I'd have to go back and reread, but Nancy, you have an idea exact, exactly when the or, ordinance would kick in, how many, like if it's four lots or more, is that what you said? It would kick in. 
um, the preservation ordinance. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Nancy. Yeah, I think that's what Nancy said. So right. a subdivision of two or three would not. Right. So I'm looking at Ricky to make sure that I've got the exemption <laughs> right. Right. Oh. But yes, I think it's four, four lots. But then also, like, it also depends on what the development is. So there could be other triggers. Like if they build a road, then right. that is a trigger. Right. And they major that is not that is no longer a minor subdivision. The same right. major subdivision. So. Just to say all a piece of property, sometimes it's hard for us as staff to tell you, yes, it's going right. to trigger it or no, because it depends on what the future development of that property is. Right. If it's a single family home, it's not going to trigger it. But if they do four lots or more, it will. Be. That's a yeah. complete, it's not a complete exemption then. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. You're right, Nancy. It's three lots out on less than two acres. Is three how lots. it's worded. Three lots out of less than two acres. Okay, so and then it kicks in above that. Yeah. So, so if it's four okay. lots, if it's four lots, it would it apply, as Nancy said, or if they took the same parcel that zoned multifamily and built three houses on that. Right. That's the multifamily development. Then it would apply to that project as well. So so any well yeah so below a half acre lot is kicking it in. Basically, if it's it, it just like it, it just depends on the development. Right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Anything else on this issue for now? We're going to revisit this in just a moment. Right. But <clears throat> All right. Well, then we'll go on to old business. And first of all, the budget request update. Kim, I don't know if you're still here, but it's my understanding that basically the budget is more or less settled for the upcoming year. So our best bet would be to start planning for next year now. Do you have anything to add to that? The uh, manager's budget was presented at our last meeting of city council. The public hearing is coming up on June 8th and city council is anticipating to um, vote at the following meeting, which will be the last uh, meeting of June. So yes, um, advocacy always starts earlier and earlier every year. It is right. not currently recommended um, to fund the master plan as suggested or uh, a staff position for Forrester. Right. That was my understanding. Um, so we can discuss this and see if we want to make a plan now for next year. Um, Ed, go ahead. Yeah, over the course of the last four years or so, I think we've built a really strong case for um, the need for a staff urban forester and a, a comprehensive urban forest master plan for the city. Um, what, what, what do we have to do to convince city council um, that it's in everybody's best interest to move forward with this? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm starting to feel a little frustrated. We did our research, we did the science, we've shown how, um, it's, it's costing the city hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in ecosystem services because they're losing urban forest cover. We've documented what the urban heat island is and, and we've shown ways that we can reverse it. We've documented the need for a comprehensive urban forest master plan through our um, sustainability audit or gap analysis. What, what more can we do besides what we have already done to convince city council that it's in everybody's best interest to make this a priority. And I'll, I'll hold the container for that because I'm assuming that might be directed in my direction. So um, I would say that I, for one, can speak for myself that I appreciate the work that the Urban Forestry Commission has done to um, research, advocate, communicate, share information um, that is certainly fully within the role of this committee's work. And um, I think that you're doing every part of it um, that you have been tasked with and asked to do. And many of you have gone above and beyond. Um, we do have a number of priorities, um, which were listed as a top four in the um, council retreat. Um, it is my understanding the communication I've received is that maintaining our tree canopy and protecting our tree canopy is now an operationalized status so moved out of a priority status and into it's just ongoing. Um, so I think the next step seems to be identified as following up on how the ordinance 
is being effective or not will be the next case for council to review um, and one that I think we would all benefit from having your advisement on. And that makes sense. I'm going to jump in. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, what's becoming more concerning for me is that without specifically the urban forester position, this work and this research and all of this is falling into this limbo area where we have DSD staff, which is super helpful, but it's not technically in there. It's not technically under the arborist and it's not technically under this group of volunteers. And so I'm personally seeing the urban forester position becoming increasingly crucial if we actually want to get what you just asked for, the data, the follow-up, all of this um, just really needs someone to head up that program to get that going. Um, anyway, I'll take other comments. I think Patrick's hand was next. So yes, um, I agree that, uh, well, let me put it, start this way. I'm not sure why the um, outcome or the evaluation of the tree canopy preservation ordinance has any real direct relation to whether or not the city um, funds a position for an urban forester. Um, you know, the at best, the, uh, the uh, preservation ordinance protects, I think, 15% of existing trees uh, on, on uh, properties that are subject to development. So we continue to lose trees at a rate that is not sustainable. And certainly we're not at a zero net loss uh, of our tree, urban tree canopy or anything close to that. And it's going to take, um, as Amy uh, pointed out, more and stronger management practices um, to get to that zero net loss um, goal that we're having and which I will point out the city council unanimously approved a zero net canopy loss policy uh, for the city of Asheville. So, um, you know, just like Susan Michael was saying in her um, comments to us, the clock is ticking on our urban forestry uh, tree canopy and we can't afford for uh, that time to run out. And while it certainly is um, apparently not going to happen for this budget, um, I think that the uh, we need to press ahead with whatever we can to encourage the city council to seriously, and I'll repeat that, seriously consider funding an urban forester in the next budget or else it's going to be too late and the city will just keep kicking this can down the road to the point where it's going to become irrelevant. Well, I will add that um, as the saying goes, it ain't over till it's over. I have gotten a lot of emails from members of this committee and members of the public who've been advocating for exactly what you're saying. Um, and I do hope that some will continue to write and call and provide public comment um, on this budget hearing on June 8th. Yeah. Well, that's encouraging. Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, um, I agree with uh, what's been said. I, um, the point is, I think we're, we're building the future city right now. Um, and what we do now is going to affect the future of Asheville. And um, we've got to set the pattern now. Um, but otherwise, development's going to rule us rather than us uh, driving development to where it needs to be. The community um, consensus on how we want to develop in our vision for the future. And a lot of that revolves around um, Asheville being a green city. And unless we build that structure, our green infrastructure in our tree canopy, 
uh, we won't have that option later. Um, so uh, development is going uh, quickly in Asheville. Larger and larger development is being proposed. Um, so I think it's critical that we keep building the case. I think Ed's right, we've got the pieces. I think I, I, I would urge us to get involved in the building our city series that a lot of, um, I think it gets a lot of attention from city council, the building our city series, um, and have a program on it next year, pulling some of these pieces together with an outside speaker. Uh, uh, I think um, that's one step, but um, anyway, th there are options for us, but um, those decisions are being made right now, what the city's gonna be. And we all, I think we all know that inherently. <clears throat> yes, thanks, Steve. Um, Ed? <clears throat> you're, you're muted. You're muted, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I apologize. But I, I want to thank Steve and Patrick for their comments. They're both very articulate. And um, I couldn't agree more with what both said. It's important to understand that um, I, I get the sense that there's this trees versus development kind of thing going on, um, and and it doesn't have to be that way. I think if we had a really good plan and an urban forester on staff, the whole idea is to reconcile those conflicts between trees and development um, to, to everybody's benefit. Um, they, they, I've seen it work in so many other cities across the southern U.S. that um, for decades, and, and Asheville is probably 30 or 40 years behind the curve now um, in reconciling those conflicts. Um, and one thing, Kim, that I don't know if you know is that um, the only oversight we have with respect to urban forestry um, is, is through volunteers on the Technical Review Committee. For years, volunteers have been reviewing plans, um, providing that oversight, and, and that's just unprecedented. There should be professional staff doing that, not volunteers. And, and um, Sharon's very good at what she does, uh, but we may not have the luxury of Sharon doing this forever. And, and I think there's a real urgency to putting, putting that expertise on that committee. So um, I, I just, I couldn't express this more strongly. I think we really need to, I don't know, I guess we have to weigh in during the public comment uh, period on, on June 8th, try to have our voices heard. But, um, I, I don't think that anybody listens. I'm really frustrated. Um, I'm going to jump in one more time. Um, my question to the group then is, um, and we can continue to discuss, but something to think about, do we want to continue to have these two big ticket items in one request? Or would it maybe be more doable to break it apart and push for, for example, the urban forester position first, you know, as a smaller piece um, and maybe it'd be more palatable to city council. So I'm going to throw that out there, but we can continue to discuss uh, uh, Sharon's hand went up. Um, to, to respond to your question, Amy, um, we've had that, you and I, and I think all of us have had that discussion before. Uh, we've gone back and forth and uh, we all have diverging opinions, but I agree. I think we should pick one and stay with it. <clears throat> My question to Kim is, um, I've sat in a couple meetings with our city uh, manager and she has always wanted to keep it in-house. And um, in one particular meeting, um, there was no discussion other than keeping it in-house when she first joined. This was her solution. And I think it was budgetary at that moment or because she was new, she didn't understand um, the position we're in here at Asheville. And what I, my question to you is, if you can answer it, how uh, much of an influence does she have on um, how council uh, looks at our need for an urban forester and a urban master plan? Is she that influential? Because I know she has not been agreeable in, pa in the past. Well, I would say um, to try to take some of the 
person out of it and look at the process like because one day I won't be in this position you know just because of time and biology science you know um, is that the city manager is absolutely tasked with running the day-to-day -day operations and um, with providing council with a budget and as a tree with seven leaves I am part of a city council body with seven people um, this leaf understands the urgency at hand um, and has heard your request and has followed this conversation for years um, the city manager may choose in their role to make different decisions on budgetary priorities um, based on having at least four leaves on this tree um, speak, speaking the same um, in Congress. So that's just about the process we would need to have. Um, we need more people to be talking about this and to elevating, be elevating it. You're already doing that work. A lot of us were in the same room with Asheville Greenworks. We have partners that we can work with. Um, we have regional funding resources that have not been discussed because it's outside the scope of um, this group. Um, but I think you are exactly on the right path. Um, and I just ask that you'll continue the work. Thanks, Kim. Go ahead, Patrick. So, um, and I'll answer your um, question, Amy, and then I'm going to have a question of my own. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, since the Urban Forest Master Plan is um, a one-time expense, you could look at that and say that's the, e that's the low-hanging fruit that we can go after uh, right now. Because once that money is appropriated and a master plan is developed, that's the end of that kind of um, funding requirement. To me, the danger of that is that then we have an urban forest master plan that gets put on the shelf, gathers dust, and is totally meaningless. So as far as I'm concerned, and my position has never wavered in the past three years, is that we need to go for funding for an urban forester first, because I don't want to leave um, the, the uh, planning for an urban forest master plan to a consultant. I want to leave that to in the hands of an urban forester who is not only committed to the program, committed to other policies to save our urban forest uh, canopy, but who's going to be here and have a commitment to saving our urban forest canopy. So that's my response to your question, Madam Chair. My question that, um, and, and it goes to the, the budget uh, process. As I understood it, and I could be wrong, but uh, as I understood it, uh, the requests that were put in for the previous budget in terms of new staffing uh, included a request to fund an urban forester. And my understanding is those requests were automatically uh, recycled over into this budget process. So therefore, I'm assuming that the urban forestry position was still included in the uh, budget request uh, that was submitted by the Department of Development Services to the city manager and the city finance office. So my question is, when those bud departmental budget requests go to the city manager, et cetera, is there a step where the department director then sits down and says, these are my staff requests for the budget. These are the reasons why I think it's important. And if that is in fact so, I'd like to know what the DSD response was to the city manager in terms of the funding request for an urban forester. So that's probably me that has to answer that one. Um, 
It's true, Patrick. So yeah, the budget, the department puts together an operating budget and then adds any additional requests and we submit that to the budget office. And then, then eventually it goes from the budget office to the city manager's office and then finally to Councilwoman uh, Roney and the rest of the council. Um, in this case, in this year's budget, it's been a really strange year coming out kind of the pandemic and um, all the requests that were submitted last year were just rolled over into the department's budget request. And y'all y'all actually helped write that. So you, you know what that says. Um, I will add additionally, we um, DSD requested two other positions to help with noise ordinance enforcement. Um, so we actually had a number of position requests included in our budget, um, as well as things that we need to support that. So we, we've got a lot on our plate. Um, so yeah, I mean, with all that to answer, I think answer your question, Patrick, all that goes forward to the budget office. And of course we give supporting information to support all our requests, but ultimately, and I'll just say real candidly, you know, as, and I don't know the number, but I always hear like every year when the department submit their budget request, they are millions and millions more than the city actually has in terms of money. So there is a difficult process that the budget staff and the manager and ultimately council have to go through to just kind of prioritize those. Um, but we do, you know, when we make the request, we try to be honest and transparent and, and do the best we can. So those decision makers know what we need and, and you know, the priority of what we need. Well, I, I appreciate the explanation, Ben. So I'm assuming that then if there were priorities that DSD saw this year in terms of new funding position, that the urban forester was not one of those priorities? It's a priority, Patrick, but I'll be candid in terms of, you know, the count or the city's four budget priorities, one being reimagining public safety. We really need help with noise ordinance enforcement. So for my day to day operations, that's probably a much more challenging area for this department right now. OK, I mean, I, I appreciate your honesty and um, uh, and giving the commission the the background on the budget process from from your standpoint. Thank you. And and just to be to be clear, I mean, eventually to build a successful urban forestry program, we do need an urban forester. We do need a master plan. You know, all all those things need to be planned for and put into place to be successful as a department, a commission, and city. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Ben. And the other comments. So at this point, um, I think we should wait just a moment to finalize our priorities for the upcoming budget, obviously, until this year's budget is passed. And so our challenge would be as ourselves and individuals and um, reaching out to our advocacy groups and arms to do what we can for June 8th and go from there. Is there any other discussion with that? This is Kim. I'll just add that I know that we've um, passed a stated climate emergency. Um, the lack of urgency sometimes that is around that is not lost on me. Um, it weighs every day. Um, so thank you for being at the table and advancing these priorities um, with the urgency that is required. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. in my mind, I'm already planning the extended make the case for these priorities. It sounds to me like what needs to happen is when council makes priorities for next year, we need to be in that top priority list. And not just we, this whole, everything with sustainability. And I think our best bet is to build those threads together where urban forestry overlaps with sustainability and climate and energy and stormwater and all of these pieces that we know, but are we really, really, really getting that into council's mind that it's all connected? So Yeah, yeah, we need to co connect all those pieces. I agree completely with that, yeah. Okay, any other comments for budget right now? Really appreciate your input, Kim. Thank you so much for being here. 
Okay, uh, next on the agenda is the tree canopy protection ordinance update. Um, and so what we're looking for here is the discussion that we've kind of touched on previously. How is the ordinance working? You know, what can we get out of it? What kind of data is being collected? I've seen in the past week some questions from the community and the people in our community are asking things like, how do we know this is working? How is it different from before? You know, how can we answer those questions to the community? And in my mind, you know, as a scientist, those are data driven questions. So what information can we get from projects that have come through to answer those questions? So um, I don't know, Nancy, if you had anything ready or Ricky or who can help address how we're going to move forward with collecting information on the ordinance. Right. So currently, um, I did not get full of the data because yet I didn't have time to do that for where we are now. But um, I know Chris has been working with Jerry, who works in our within our permit um, software. Staff has the ability to like input the data from the plan sheets as to what you know, how many trees are being preserved, how much square footage, um, square footage, footage preserved, um, planted, and then the in I think are the options. Ricky, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and we're working with Jerry to be able to pull those reports easily so we can get those to you every month, like as a week, as a monthly update. Um, I can do them, and we can do like month where we are like this month capture. And then I can also look at capturing like from different time periods and reporting that too. So that's just, um, I know that Chris has been working with Jerry to move that forward. So, um, cause I manually have to go find that information now, which takes a bit of time. All right, um, Sharon, go ahead. Um, so I do not know how to, when I look at plants to figure out what the percentage of a site is and how the, uh, I'm trusting staff because staff is a whole lot smarter than I am, but I am still not able to figure out how you're getting to your percentages that are existing. Um, I haven't been able to come up with uh, working with anything that we've got online that makes any sense to me. So I either need handholding or I need a better explanation um, when I'm looking at a plan and, and I see on there, they've got a, a class B urban and they've got 15.3% existing. Um, I don't know how to figure that out, whether that's correct or not. I'm just assuming it is. Now, um, with the new plans coming up, each tree um, that the, the architect is doing is correct the size of the canopy that I can figure out. I just don't know how to get to the whole site and what percentage it is that's actually being preserved or is existing. Does that make sense? <clears throat> I don't know how you get there. <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to take that. I believe they're using the canopy study in a like a GIS. Yeah, but I don't know how that's configured. That's what I'm saying yeah. is how is that technically configured? I have not uh, uh, been able to figure that out yet. So I don't know if, if Nancy or Ricky or somebody that knows uh, how to look at a site plan and figure out that percentage. Staff is doing it now somehow. I just haven't gotten that knowledge on how to figure that out to check on it to see if it is indeed correct. So we have a tree canopy map that goes with the that came from the tree canopy study that looks at all of the parcels that then identifies what that existing coverage is based on the tree canopy study. And that's for, and isn't the existing only for C? So that's what the ar architects are using and they're providing the city staff with that percentage. Mm -hmm. That's where I am not able to so on my computer i either don't have the measuring tool which i don't think i have um i and do i need to download this measuring tool so i can figure it out because when they tell me it's 10.35 percent 
I'll go, okay. And staff will say, fine, staff will, I, I'm not disagreeing with staff. I just don't know how to check that percentage. So can we maybe just have somebody hook up with Sharon? Yeah. To get that, because yeah, I've seen the map and I've used it like for my neighborhood and I just click on the parcel and it right. pulls up, you know, so we'll get you hooked up with that, Sharon, because yeah, yeah, that's wonderful if you're double checking it. Um, yeah, we'll there's, get, there's a there's a free easy measuring tool in PDF and Adobe PDF that I can show you how to use Sharon. Yeah. Thank you. We'll make sure you get it. So Thanks. Ed, go ahead. Yeah, you know, one thing that we need for, for for all this is some qualitative analysis too. I mean if we're using shape files from aerial photographs to determine areas of canopy, there's gotta be some ground uh, ground truthing behind that to make sure that these files are obtained accurately. And and then there's the quality of tree protection itself on a site um, and the quality of the trees that are being protected. Um, it doesn't do us any good to give canopy credit to some trees that might be damaged from construction activities because we're protecting their trunks and not their roots. And, um, and we end up losing the trees a couple of years down the road anyway. So, um, I, I, it, it's something that the city is going to have to, and, and we could probably advise as to how to do this, but the city has some responsibility for qu qualitative analysis on all this, on, on this new um, ordinance as well. So I was just making a note because um, yes, absolutely. So I'm putting that in my notes of, I think that falls into this whole overview of looking at where the issues and exemptions and how the ordinance is playing out. Um, but those kind of issues definitely because protecting a dying tree and qual calling that your existing um, canopy is not going to work in the long run and it's not going along with the intention of the ordinance. Right. So, well, and in measuring shape files from aerial photographs too. Um, because the angle of the shot that's taken, it can give you um, false areas or we could undercut areas. So we, we need to do some ground truthing with that as well. Agreed. Uh, Sharon, go ahead. Um, also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we've got an instance where there's going to uh, very old trees are being used uh, for 719-1. But with the amount of construction going on, I have asked for an arborist report to say, well, these trees live three years later after the construction because the compaction on the roots. So we've got sometimes they won't die right away. We've got a three year wait or a two year wait with the decline, which is definitely having to do with the construction. So we have that issue as well uh, to say, well, they could die in three years where you replace these at that time. Um, so we've got this long range issue as well with this uh, uh, new ordinance. That's true. Everything with trees is long term. So um, we actually might touch on that when we talk about enforcement as well. Um, any other questions? The other thing that comes to mind with the tree canopy protection ordinance is the fee in lieu. Um, obviously, at the very beginning, we didn't you know, know exactly how that would work. But as fees start coming in, we're going to need to work on a process and, you know, nailing down the details of how that money is spent. Um, you know, because obviously a pool of money, everybody's going to have a different idea of what to do with that. So we need to make sure that this group is at the table so that we can help to set up what those conditions are going to be on, on how that money is used. Um, so I guess at this point, my request to staff is as soon as those talks start going on, um, we need to be there. So, yep. so, so, <laughs> so dead, dying, and disease trees do not be part of your tree protection. <laughs> Design professionals have to make those determinations. Um, and Yes, you will be part of that conversation as far as being Lou. Um, we're working internally to try and figure out 
how do we even do this? Because this is our first time with this and, and understanding some finance and other things and what steps we need to take um, internally and then also how y'all can be plugged in to that and make and, and in that decision making um, and what that looks like. So what what are we going to need to ask from you guys? Is this a formal working group? Is it the entire group? That's what we need to um, kind of figure out from what some best practices from other groups and, and get with finance to, to understand that. So, okay, excellent. An urban forester would be super helpful in this situation. Um, any other comments and ideas with the tree canopy protection ordinance? Did I miss anybody? All right, so obviously we're going to keep working on this, and um, we have a nice little list for Chris Collins's follow-up list, so we'll make sure he gets that information. All right, next is working group updates, starting with the open space amendment working group. And Patrick, did you have an update since Perrin's not here? Um, I'll hold on one second. I um, will give a... Um, overview uh, of where we are and then I could ask um, Ed or uh, Sharon to uh, fill in any blanks that they have. Um, we, we had a meeting back in the middle of May. At the end of the meeting, the uh, uh, Department of Planning had or Videla Slapka, who is the uh, urban planner in charge of the open space um, uh, ordinance amendment had decided that we had concluded um, the task force uh, goal of uh, discussing and agreeing with changes to the ordinate, uh, open space ordinance amendment. Uh, following that, um, Perrin emailed uh, Videla and the Department of Planning and said, no, we're not done with this. There are still other, there are still a lot of outstanding issues as far as the Urban Forestry Commission working group is concerned. And he requested that we have um, at least one additional meeting, which we had, I believe it's on May 26th. Um, one of the Urban Forestry Commission's positions on um, the uh, open space amendment was uh, that the uh, open space amendment should apply to um, projects in the Central Business District and the River Arts District. Uh, at one point, um, we reached a decision within the working group that we would withdraw our insistence on having open, split, open space apply to the Central Business District contingent upon the city and the urban forestry working group working together to make changes to improve the standards for tree planning in the uh, CBD as well as other um, environmental improvements to uh, such as bioswales um, in uh, in tree planting in the in in the in the central business district. Um, we are proceeding simultaneously with discussions with the city on changes to um, the UDO as well as changes to the. Um, standards and specification manuals that would accomplish that purpose. Um, we've had one meeting, I think, on the um, changes to the UDO and the manual. We'll have other meetings um, on that. Uh, as far as the River Arts District is concerned, um, it, it appeared that the city was willing to either have open space um, as part of the um, uh, River Arts District, uh, as well as perhaps uh, using the amenities section in the River Arts Form Code District apply to the Central Business District. 
However, when the city discussed this proposal with the River Arts District uh, property owners, they did not want to have any part of uh, a open space requirement for the RAD unless there was some way to um, designate any fee in lieu uh, for developers who couldn't meet the open space uh, standard in the RAD to go toward helping the River Arts District uh, property owners with maintenance costs. Um, that's not been resolved at this point. Uh, we also had some issues regarding um, uh, landscaping requirements um, and the uh, open space amendment as uh, for credits uh, in lieu of open space. So from there, I'll, I'll ask Ed or Sharon if they want to provide any more specifics on that. I, I think that was a good overview, Patrick. I don't have anything further to add. Um, I do. Um, we've talked about uh, giving open space, space credit to buffers, which uh, have not been allowed previously. And I am in support of that um, because buffers get reduced, as we all know, through alter alternative compliance. And they've got a number of ways with uh, fencing and to reduce the green space. And I said to incentivize existing plants and the buffer between um, residences or businesses that we get make that open space because uh, a type B buffer is 30 feet, a type A buffer is 20 feet. Um, and without the fence, which reduces it by 50%, um, to give credit for saving that's existing or adding the existing, making it open space, and then not uh, um, uh, giving the credit for open space if it's an alternative compliance request by 50%. Um, I just thought it was a good way of incentivizing, keeping green and keeping the spaces in between uh, developments. And, and to clarify, um, both Perrin and Ed and myself uh, supported Sharon in, that, in, in her position on that within the task force. Okay, any questions for Patrick or the working group there? Uh, it sounds like y'all are doing really, well, first of all, a lot of work on this, a lot of meetings and certainly representing the interests of the UFC. I don't see anything um, to add or, or change there. So I appreciate all the work there. Thank you so much. All right, next is the policy committee um, working group. So Ed has an update for us. Yeah, we, we've uh, proceeded to work, do some work on chapter 20. Um, we, we did a, a markup just identifying areas of chapter 20 that need to get revised, which is basically the entire, entire chapter it needs a complete rewrite. And um, Patrick, Steve, Sharon and I met and, and discussed and um, they put in play a process for moving ahead with the revision. And right now it's in Patrick's court and he and I are gonna be collaborating on a re, uh, draft revision of, of that chapter. And Amy, I, I think I had talked to you about mailing that initial markup to you. Did I, did I ever do that? Did I ever um, send you that email? I don't have it yet, not to me, not yet. Oh, okay, I apologize. Um, or, I'll, I'll do that right after this Let meeting. me double check. No, not yet. <laughs> okay. 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 But yeah, um, I appreciate that's, that. That's really all I have to report at this at this point. Okay. Um, oh, Sharon, go ahead. Um, Nancy, can I uh, ask if the city will um, bound up a copy of the SSDM for me? Not the whole thing, but just the ones that are uh, the pages that are the planting requirements. I can pull out the pages I need out of it. Um, instead of me having it, sending it to Office Depot and printing it up, can I ask the city to, uh, to do that for me? Because we're using the uh, updating with Chapter 20 
a lot of the planting requirements in there are not up to date and we want to go through everything in there to make sure that it falls within the updated standards of uh, criteria and I didn't want to have to break with the money to do this and I uh, begged the city to pay for this if I asked for the pages of it and have it bound or is that not something I can do? I can ask, I don't know if that, but I will find out. And so Sharon, maybe if you want to email what specifically you want. Then what pages have something I want, to, I will. Yeah, yeah they'll have something got, to act on. <clears throat> okay, yeah, I'll do that. That's on my and list of things to do. If it doesn't work out, get a hold of me, please. Okay. I'll help you out with that. Okay, All right, thanks. yeah. Um, well, with the policy working group, so one thing that's come up through the community and some of the email threads that we see is the issue with the heritage trees, you know, that we know this is an ongoing thing. Do we, are we ready to start talking about that as a piece of the tree canopy protection ordinance, or do we want to still sort of wait to work on that until we can get more data through the whole uh, implementation of the ordinance? Uh I'm, I'm always ready to talk about that. Um, the, the language in the canopy amendment was there and then it was pulled out by the city attorney and it would be very easy to put it back in again. Um, but, I, but again, I think the city wants to wait until we've gone through a year to, to you know, evaluate the effectiveness of the ordinance before they make any changes. So I'm not then, sure there's anything that we could do yeah. at this point. And it makes sense, you know, if you're going to change something, you know, if there's something else that needs to be changed, you know, then we're not changing it continuously. So, all right, well, I just want to make sure that it's on top of mind for everyone, because I know it is with the community members. <laughs> it's on the top of their mind. So, all right, well, then we will keep talking about it and see when the appropriate time to implement that is. All right, anything else from policy working group? That wonderful. Thank you so much for your work on chapter 20. So we'll see what we can do with that. All right. Next is the mission statement working group. And um, I did receive an edit from Ed that was really simple, added the word equitable in a key location on this document here. Um, but I just got that a couple days ago. So Dawn, did you get a chance to do any um, edits on that? Sorry, Amy, I have not. Yet. That's okay. That's okay. It's, fine um but when you get a chance we would look forward to your suggestions and then we can move forward with maybe adopting this here so where, where no was, problem go uh, ahead is it included in the uh document we had for reference uh not an updated version whatever the past okay. version was um like i said the edit from ed was literally one word that i just got um, where, oh is it in the first it's in yeah the, in the very uh, first line because we have yeah. it in the second paragraph it's in the, yeah it's in the first line as well okay. which is but, fine so yeah. but once we get um more input on that then we'll bring it up and see if we can vote it in and then work to implement it with the city so all right lastly for trc um we don't have anything new to report i don't think but what i was wondering is can i attend a trc meeting i you know i don't have anything to add or say i would just like to see the process so if i could put in a request to um, get on the, you know, to be able to just go. But Sharon, go ahead. Yeah, if you just, um, um, cause Patrick uh, attend, get, gets the notifications on TRC to go. So it has public comment. You can just show up um, um, as just, you know, a normal person and just log into it. I can send you if you want the links every time I get them and when the meetings are. You don't have to do that. I'll get it from city staff if I need it. But Nancy? Yeah, we'll get, we can get you on the list. That'd be cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. That was it. Just that way then I can have a little more information so that when Sharon and I try to put something together for moving forward with that, then I'll know what's going on. All right. So good job working groups. So next is 424 Sunset. This is the project that um, Ed and Sharon have been working on that had a uh, violation. And so is there an update on where they're at with that project? Go ahead, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ed and I walked up 
Um, and um, I have not yet done our recommendations um, for what we see. Uh, we spend a fair amount of time up there. And um, boy, everything they planted pretty much is dead um, that they were required to plant. Um, it's either on its way out or out. So, um, and then on top of needing to replace what uh, has died that they've planted, um, we've made some recommendations to uh, add um, shrubs, uh, trees, hardwood trees, and um, some ground cover in areas. I just have not had a chance to sit down and it's on my job to do this week, this weekend to get it. And I will submit it to, I believe, uh, Ricky and Ed when I'm done with it. Ed's already, and I've already talked over the trees. I just need to put it in a readable format. But Ricky, I haven't talked with you since then, but FYI, just about every evergreen tree they planted up there is, uh, has died. Right. There's, there's one spot halfway between or maybe a third of the way between the house and the road below. Um, it was an old, um, it looks like an old logging road um, that has been sort of impounded by some boulders that holds the runoff back. Um, and, and that has a pretty big blowout in it. And we're recommending that some stone be brought in to improve the impounding of, of water runoff. You could just tell that a lot of, a lot of water from the road above and, and from that property drains to this one spot. Um, so they do have some issues up there. But I think between the stone and the plant material that we're recommending, it'll, it'll really solve the problem and bring the property back into compliance. Yeah, Monty, we may, we may need to get somebody to check that out because me and Sharon talked about it. I believe when the site was remediated back in 15 after the second failure there's supposed to be a system up there that captures water and uh, so if it's blown out then that might be violating that permit so that's good to know Ed that we have that problem now it, it's uh, clearly it's clearly yeah. blown out you can access it from the road you really it's kind of hard to get there from the house but if you go to the road below and work your way up that easement um, it, it's clear as day um, that it's washing out and um, it, it really simple solution. They just have to bring a bunch of big rocks in and close that, that impoundment again. Yeah, I just, um, I just wrote it down to have Danny go take a look at it. And, and, and FYI, it's for sale. So if the house does sale, but uh, happens to sell before this is remediated, does it follow the new owners? Or does it stay with the old owners? It goes with the, to the new owners as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, because it, it is for sale. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get on this as quick as I can. No, it, it went on. When did it go on the market? So this the is day we, the day we were up there, and we had a, a bit of a confrontation with the with the owner, but um, it it went on the day that Ed and I walked uh, walked the property. Okay. All right, well, thank you all for the update there. Next is legislation update from Patrick. We had spoke about this last time. And so give us an update on um, Senate Bill 349, House Bill 401. So um, the update hasn't changed. Um, the bills, neither bill met the um, May 13th deadline for uh, a chamber vote so they're still in committee and technically according to the legislative rules um, they would have to be resubmitted in the 2023 um, general uh, assembly session however um, recently uh, senator chuck edwards one of the two senators who represents uh, Buckham County and the city of Asheville, uh, went on a local TV station and said that uh, while he understood that the bills didn't meet this technical requirement, he still committed to the bills and pushing them forward and insinuated that there are other um, avenues to 
pushed the bill um, to the floor of the Senate and the House during this current session. So um, I think just out of uh, caution that um, we should um, uh, vote on a resolution that I was asked to prepare. And I think, um, Haley, if you wanted to put that up on the screen, um, or um, I'm hoping that people on the commission had a chance to look at it in the documents, uh, that we should go ahead and urge the city council um, for the two major reasons that are in the resolution to um, stay opposed to the uh, an enactment of Senate Bill 349 and House Bill 401. So unless there's any questions, um, I would move, um, make a motion to support the Urban Forestry Commission resolution on Senate Bill 340 and House Bill 401. All right, we have a motion to approve this resolution. Is there any discussion? Questions? Everybody remembers our discussion from last month. So this is just asking city council to be aware of this and have it on their radar as opposing this state legislation. All right, if there's no comment, we can have a second. I second. All right, and then we can vote. So the motion to pass this resolution to city council. So Patrick? Aye. Ed? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Steve? Aye. Dawn? Aye. And I vote aye. So the motion and resolution pass. We'll forward this to city council. Thank you, Patrick, for your work on that. Yes. Thank All you, right. Paul. And we'll keep an eye on uh, what happens with that through the state legislature in the future as well. All right, so next on the agenda we had from last month, the urban place UDO amendment. Um, so this is the setting up specific urban place uh, locations throughout the city that would have special zoning and planning requirements. Um, where's the city at with those? They're still under discussion, is that correct? So um, this morning, well, I worked over, well, um, the, um, the, uh, the subcommittee of the Coalition of Asheville Neighborhoods, who is in discussion with the city uh, about some changes to the urban place uh, district form code, um, made some recommendations. Uh, I put those in a document and I sent those to the city this morning um, one of the uh, several things that are pertinent to um, the Urban Forestry Commission is that the original form code language exempted um, building impact trees uh, from the uh, form, uh, code form district. We have recommended um, that that exempted be uh, deleted so that building impact trees will be required. Uh, in our discussions, we felt that um, there, there were, they were needed to help with the, um, not only the, the ambient, ambience of these uh, mixed use uh, project developments in terms of having trees, uh, which you know, beautifies everything, but also to help mitigate um, the heat island impact that would um, be probably quite high with, with these mixed use projects since there are essentially buildings and, um, and parking lots. Um, we also uh, presented um, some language that would expand the um, 
uh, landscaping buffer that would re be required between these um, projects and adjacent residential developments. So um, the ball is now in the, in the city's court. And um, I'm hoping that when I get back from vacation that we'll have uh, a meeting to uh, resolve any outstanding issues um, with this. And um, then I can report back to uh, the commission at the next meeting. Um, Sharon, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, it just uh, the buffer. Um, the buffer urban place buffer now says 30 feet a B and they wanted uh, we're recommending it be reduced down to 10 and then with a 50% reduction if fencing was used and um, between RM uh, uh, multi-use and single family, I felt that we should not reduce the buffer and also buffers being allowed for 719-1 and buffers being credited for open space, that the green space, if we give credit for open space and credit for tree canopy, that um, that would incentivize keeping buffers between the residential and this. So that was my thinking on that when we changed that. And also just to clarify that the uh, tree, tree canopy preservation ordinance will apply to these uh, urban place um, form districts. Good. Well, I think that buffers would be important as well. So appreciate your work on that. Any other questions or comments about that? Um, the urban place form districts. All right. Thanks for the update on that. So moving on to new business, the first item is wind set, wind swept drive and um, Sharon, and I believe Monty, that's why we brought you in here yeah. as well. But Sharon, if you want to give us an overview. Um, I've been uh, uh, emailing Monty, I think since March and he, uh, uh, I want to acknowledge the fact that they're completely understaffed with uh, illness and the zoning enforcement. So I was driving Monty in my usual nuts emails. Um, and uh, finally, um, I asked if he could uh, appear before Urban Forestry. I got a, a member that, uh, a person that used to work for the city, now works for the county, noticed this. This is up on Windswept, which is above me where I live, and I never noticed it. Someone had come in and topped all the trees and then had clear cut without any grading a huge amount of trees on this uh property that is not developed on a steep slope B. And so it's taken uh, a while for a city to go out there because just for the lack of uh, staff at the moment. Sorry. And I got an email um, from uh, Monty saying that someone was going to go out and take a look and said that there was a violation with the tree topping. And then I mentioned that, uh, well, they took down all the trees without a permit. And I'm assuming on steep slope B, um, we still need a permit to, uh, or a design to remove all those trees, regardless if there was any grading or not. So I think what we're just waiting for is a staff report. Yeah, and, and a little bit of follow up on that. Of course, I would lean on Ricky for the technical end of the permitting requirements, but actually the notice of violation went out today um, to the owners on that. And in all honesty, it is a staffing issue for the most part. But one of the issues I had with some of the emails from Sharon is I get a lot of emails and frankly, I lost one of them way back in the email. <laughs> so I had to get caught back up on that. Um, but that's where it stands from the mechanic side of getting the NOV issue. But again, like I said, with, with any of the, the technical questions specific to the violation, I would, I'd lean on Ricky for that one. Okay, um, because I, I know your email said for tree topping, but I was thinking that being on steep slope B, that they have to have a, uh, a plan uh, before they, uh, I mean, they can top every tree if they have a plan and a permit in the steep slope B. Um, and I didn't see anything on file. So Ricky, is, is Ricky still on? 
Oh, that's right. He went to the 160D meeting, I think. So maybe Nancy, do you know whether uh, I can I can email Ricky and ask him what on that. that need the permit? Yeah, for uh, yeah. cutting down all the trees on a B because yeah. uh, ninety percent of the trees were cut. All trees on B are protected over a certain diameter. Yeah. Yeah, and also uh, our zoning enforcement officer actually went back out first thing this morning before she wrote the notice of violation up to make sure that she captured everything that's there. Thank you. And that'll go on Excella, right? So I can follow that through on Excella. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for that. Sure. And since we have Monty here um, with enforcement, is, is there anything else we want to ask him or talk about? Really appreciate you taking the time to be here. We often, as a group, run into these kind of issues, most often reported to us from the community. And so, you know, just looking for the best way to communicate with you and your group. You know, obviously, you know, Sharon does a lot of this. She gets a lot of these calls and gets in touch with you. But if there's anything we can do to help, you know, and, and be a resource for you, we'd be happy to do that. Well, I can kind of give you a really quick overview we really just started kind of a new system in zoning enforcement. Um, and I can give you kind of a quick overview of how it's working now. Um, and back to the staffing issue, we are, we do have uh, a listing to hire another zoning enforcement officer. Um, and we're going through that process right now. So we'll have two. And the reality is we could use three or four, but that's, you know, that's down the road somewhere. Uh, so basically, 95% of the complaints that we receive come through the Asheville app. And we have staff in our uh, permit center now that, that goes through all of those requests that come through. And he kind of weeds through because obviously a lot of them are zoning related or grading related and he goals them to where they go. Once he discovers the ones that, that actually apply to us, uh, he'll create an enforcement case in Excel, which, you know, has an assigned number, which I, you know, uh, sent one to share the other day about this case. Once that's done, it goes into a section in Excel that's called My Task, which is mine. I look at those every day to see what's come through, and then I assign them out to the zoning inspector of choice. Of course, right now there's only one to choose from. And they take it from there. They'll go out, they'll look at the site, they'll get all the pictures, issue the notice of violation, whatever needs to happen. And everything that she does in the field gets recorded. A copy of the notice of violation will be in Excel so anyone can look at it. Um, so that's how we're functioning right now. Um, obviously, anyone can contact me directly if they need to, if you see anything that, that needs to be reported. But that's kind of it in a nutshell. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Monty while he's here? Well, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for <laughs> sitting through the rest of our meeting, but um, hopefully maybe you got something out of it of how we operate and, and how we might be able to work together. So. Yeah, I learned actually quite a bit that I didn't know. So it's, okay. it's been really good. Good, well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right, bye guys. Thanks, have a good one. All right, uh, next we'd like to introduce Allie Fouts. Again, thank you for sitting through our meeting. And um, Allie is a student at UNC Asheville working on some research on Asheville's urban forest canopy. So Allie, if you want to introduce yourself and give us an overview of your research. Yes, thank you, Amy. Um, my internet just glitched. Am I still here? Yeah, it looks okay, good. Cool, thank you. Um, yes, thank you. I'm Allie Fouts. I am a rising senior at UNC Asheville. I'm majoring in environmental management and policy and minoring in econ and also pursuing the state sustainability certificate. I am currently also a McCullough Fellow. Um, and so my research is, as Amy said, focusing on the urban tree canopy in Asheville and specifically kind of looking at the economic and social significance, especially. Um, and so kind of trying to tie it all together um, from not just an environmental kind of um, service, it's the turban tree canopy is, as we all know, more than just important to the wildlife. It's extremely important to us for many reasons. And so I hope with my research to kind of demonstrate how interdisciplinary um, the urban tree canopy really is. So I'm working with Dr. Leah Greed and Matthews from the Econ Department and also um, Perrin DeYoung, as you all know, 
is my um, is my community partner. So the questions I am using to guide my research are along the lines of what are the benefits of associated with urban tree canopy cover um, in specific and or in general, but also specifically in Asheville. Um, what are the costs associated with lack of urban tree cover um, generally and also specifically in Asheville? And lastly, how has tree cover changed over time in Asheville? And through answering these questions, I hope to kind of um, achieve like a few, here are my goals, I guess. So um, initially I hope to create an inventory that outlines the benefits of having urban tree canopy cover and also the costs or harms felt by those who do not have sufficient tree cover. Um, I hope to gain a better understanding of how those benefits and costs are distributed throughout the communities in Asheville. So which, which communities might um, be protected by a strong urban tree canopy, but which also looking at which communities might not have as much of a protection, might not have as many trees, and so they aren't able to reap those benefits. Um, and ultimately, I just hope to, to demonstrate why it is important to protect our urban tree canopy in the city of Asheville, um, especially um, looking at the areas that are least forwarded or have the fewest trees. Um, I would like to conduct some sort of survey or community engagement portion, but I haven't yet finalized my methods and I'm just not entirely sure that a survey could be feasible or effective or potentially what's best for the community um, because we always wanna keep the community's minds or the community's well-being top priority. So um, I may or may not be able to do a survey or some form of community engagement. Um, but that's pretty much it. I just wanted to let y'all know that I'm here, I'm doing this, and I really appreciate the opportunity to sit in this meeting and for all the connections I've been able to um, form. So thank you all. All right. Well, thank you, Allie. And we certainly look forward to the outcomes of your research and seeing what your results are. Um, it's very obviously important to us, but that's the kind of data that we use when we make our case to council. So um, uh, Steve, did you have a question? Yeah, I just have a comment. I, I, I really appreciate the work you've done, Ellie, and I looked, at, uh, looked over, um, gave an overview of what you've done so far. And I had, a, I made a few suggestions right before this meeting, but I'll be glad to tie in with you later uh, it looked like a really good foundation and we can build on that in the future. So it, it lays down a lot of connections that we need to be making um, throughout all this um, process of building our case for, you know, having a, a more um, uh, integrated management for urban forestry and having a master plan. Yes, thank you, Steve. Thank you for the feedback. I will definitely be looking at it. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out to any of us. You have all of our contact information. So mm -hmm. thank you. Hopefully maybe we'll have you back in a year or so. <laughs> you can talk about how it went. So. Let's hope. Thank you all again. That'd be great. Thank you so much. All right. So if there's nothing else, we are on the last item of new business, uh, the urban forestry master plan. So obviously we talked about this in our budget request, but, um, I'll try to overview this, but Dawn, you might need to jump in. But Asheville Greenworks was awarded a contract with the city to start some of the foundational groundwork for an urban forest master plan or management plan with the city. So as the Urban Forestry Commission, obviously we'll be involved in that as well. The very, very first step is a, well, I don't know if it's the very first step that Greenworks is taking, but one of the first steps that we're taking is a meeting with uh, just some key city partners to just start with education. What is an urban forest management plan? How does it benefit the city? What does it look like? What does it involve? You know, those pieces put together. We're actually having that first meeting tomorrow. We're still on for tomorrow, right? Um, so I was, at this point, wanted to make the commission aware that this work is going on in the background and that we are part of it and that we're getting started. This won't be anything that will lead to anything quickly, but we're getting the 
the pieces together. So um, Don or Ed, I don't know if anybody else has anything more to add on where we're at at this point. Uh, could you, uh, I was, um, I'm planning to participate in the meeting because um, that was a request last time. So um, we had a meeting. Can I uh, get a reminder on what time the meeting is? And where, is it going to be online or in person? Yeah, yes. it's online. So if Nancy or Haley, if somebody could send Steve the invitation, right. that'd be great. Right. Actually, if you can send it to me again, too, we we had it scheduled for tomorrow and then we got to save the date for the ninth and then that was canceled and I can't find the link for tomorrow's meeting. So uh, actually yeah. me either. So maybe we need to <laughs> just send that out. So. Yeah, maybe we never got it. I don't know. I don't know either. But yeah, yeah. if we could get that together. But um, Sharon, did you have a question for us? Yeah. So who, who are the key city partners? Well, right now, I think just mostly DSD. I, don't, I can't remember who else was going to be. I was just curious. Meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody remember? I sorry that I don't have the list for tomorrow. I don't know if uh, Mark probably okay. will be there. Yeah, yeah I'm um, there, and Pete Wall is there. Yeah, so it's Parks and Recreation, Sustainability, DSD, and City Arbors. Are they? We're starting small, and obviously we'll build up from there. Um, and right now, working on this project from this group is uh, myself, Don, Ed, and Steve. Um, but if anyone has a strong desire to be a part of that, we can make it a, a bigger group if we need to. No? OK, good. <laughs> um, so Nancy, what time is the meeting? 11. 11 o'clock. OK, great. 11 AM. I'll and send you all. Thank you. I've and started um, a little PowerPoint piece. I'll get it to you by the end of the day, Ed, to look thanks. at. Thanks. That'd be helpful. Uh, and then you can build on yep. whatever you want to add on to it. So. And and Allie, if you'd like to join us as an observer, you're you're welcome to as well. I believe I can make it. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Be great. Um, so we'll make sure we send you the link also. All right. Any other questions or anything I missed on where we're at with that? Okay. No, you covered it. All right. And of course, we'll be keeping everybody uh, informed with how this process goes. So I'm very excited. I've studied urban forest master plans for years. This is the first time I've been able to be involved from the ground, which is very exciting. So I, not exciting that this is the first urban forest management plan that Asheville is creating in 2021, but excited to be a part of it. So all right that's it for our regular agenda we have updates that are listed on the agenda from public works stormwater and duke um valerie you're still here did you want to talk to us about your stormwater updates sure um and i have if i need to show you a an exhibit i could share my screen and show it to you um but we have two in stormwater capital projects where we are well, the one I'm going to speak to you about first is we are removing and replacing five trees. Um, it's in an area in Sulphur Springs Road where it's one of the low points and there's a big existing box culvert and a lot of flooding in that area. So we're putting in a pretty big storm system and um, also kind of stabilizing the creek because it's been eroding and the banks are no longer like sustainable and that's where the trees are. So on the <clears throat> east side of the creek, there are two trees we're taking down and replacing. One is a big poplar and one is a big walnut. And um, it's really fortuitous to be replacing these trees because right now they're growing up into um, a pretty major utility lines. So we'll be replacing them a little bit different area. And then on the west side of the creek, there are three trees that we are replacing. The homeowner is very happy we're replacing them because um, they're covered in like ivy and vines and they're not doing very well. And they have a lot of like dead branches at the top. So we'll be taking those out and replacing them. And um, not sure what's next. Do you have questions or need to see? I can share my screen, show you an exhibit. They may have questions on that project. Sounds good. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Um, and the other. Oh, hold on. I have a, I have a, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I have a question. Um, sure. 
Are, are you going to repurpose the wood from the trees that you're taking down? I mean, I, if a walnut tree, if it's a large tree, it, it might have some pretty valuable wood in it. It may. I believe the way our contract is written is that the um, contractor is responsible for taking that down. And um, it's a good question. You know, Ed, do you mind if I get back to you on that? So I, I'm thinking is the contractor disposes of it in the way that they wish. So they might wish to keep it. But I'm not 100% sure, so I can get back to you if that's okay. Yeah, I'd like to know. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't question. remember it being a merchantable-sized tree, really, Ed. Okay, okay. Okay, that's a good one. Dumpy tree. All right. well, well, that might be of interest to the artist community, too, though, so I, I just hate to see wood brought to a landfill or whatever. Right, and yeah. these are kind of small. One is an 8-inch and one's a 12-inch. Um, and I'm curious too, because the landowner might say, well, I, I want my tree once you take it down. So yeah, that's a very good question. I will find out and I will email you and I'll get your email information from Nancy. <clears throat> okay, um, don't, don't spend a lot of time on it though. I was just curious. No, I would like to know as well. I think it's a good question. Okay. Um, Sharon, sorry, we, real quick. I, Sharon. I, I just wanted to say, you know, the ivy on the trees is a homeowner issue and um, and if we could just advise them to please keep the ivy off the trees. Um, I know that's kind of an obvious question for all of us here, but it's, you know, I mean, I see it on bow catcher all the time. Trees are declining and falling over all the time because the ivy on them. Mm -hmm. So FYI. Now I agree. And we're not taking them down because of the ivy. We're taking them down um, for the, for putting in our stormwater system. That just happened to be like, their reason why they were kind of glad we were taking them down because they're they're already um hurt from the ivy is my understanding yeah but i i get your point all right thanks go ahead to the next one okay um i just want to make sure lee morrison is not on here before i start on the next one i don't think he is okay so the other the other project we're doing is a, another stormwater system on forest hill drive in caledonia in that neighborhood and there is one area um, where a woman has two trees. Let me see what the two trees are. Two existing, um, one is a, looks like a maple and a maple, two, two small maples, like a 12 inch and a 10 inch maple. And they are right where um, our stormwater pipe needs to go. And we, we've tried to avoid, you know, trees everywhere we possibly could. And this is one area we could not avoid it. And unfortunately, um, we had to condemn this small little part of um, property to get an easement to put our, our storm pipe through. And the owner, we don't have permission to replace the trees on her property, if that makes sense. So we can't replace these two. So we're taking out these two trees and have a little permanent easement for our storm pipe to go through. We can't plant trees you know, in the permanent easement and we can't plant them outside the permanent easement because she's not um, allowing it. So that is another project we're working on and, and having to take down a couple of trees. All right. And again, I have, I have that on my screen if, if you need me to share that. I don't think so if anybody needs it. But yeah, we appreciate the updates. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, thanks. And Mark, did you want to speak to any of your updates since you're still here? Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to uh, address them. All right. Okay, and I see that Duke sent in an update that there's no maintenance, but unfortunately, uh, their representative is, again, not at our meeting. I think we'll have to bring this up again next month. So, All right. Well, then, we have reached the end of the agenda. If there are any other questions or comments, if not, we can have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. A second. Second. We have to vote. <laughs> Patrick. Aye. Ed. Aye. Sharon. Aye. Stephen. Aye. Don. Aye. And I vote aye. So thank you so much. We'll see everybody next month. Oh, real quick, sorry. If anybody will be absent as we go through the summer, please give us ample notice if you can. Appreciate it. Thank you so Thanks. much. Bye. Thank you for Bye. keeping us on time. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Have a good one.